What is church? Pews, platforms, people, or a steeple? What does it even matter? Sleep in on Sundays or don your Sunday best? Does God even care about how we invest? Is it essential, let alone consequential? And if I come to call this place home, what does it look like for me to live like a resident rather than a guest? Hey there, and welcome to a very special and exciting Sunday at Alive Church, as today we're celebrating six years of being a life-giving church in our city, and, uh, and we're gathered together at the building today, and if for whatever reason you weren't able to gather with us, we miss you, we consider you hopefully a part of the family. Um, in whatever capacity you're a part of this family, we want you to be celebrating with us. So maybe if you're watching on Facebook or something like that, leave a comment and just uh, celebrate with us six years of God's faithfulness in um, doing something special here in Fredericksburg through a live church. We're so honored for what God's done in the, the last six years and all that he's been able to accomplish through us, and we're excited to see what he has in store for us in our seventh year, because seven is a really significant number in the Bible, and we believe it's going to be a year of a lot of great things here ahead. So thanks for being a part of it. Keep on investing in, and let's jump into part two of Build Your Church. Now, just let me get a, a drink here. Um, mm. If I were to ask you, if you were sitting across from the room right, right now for me, and I were to ask you to, to pour me a glass of water, you know, you'd probably walk over and you'd pour me a glass of water and, you know, that'd be great. And, and if I asked you, what part of your body did you need to do that? You'd likely say, your hands, right? You needed your hands. Um, but if I tied your feet up and then I said, okay, walk across the room and pour me a glass of water, you'd then realize, well, I, okay, I also needed my feet, right? Like those were, they were pretty helpful in pouring a glass of water too in that situation. Or if I said, okay, you know what, actually, let's just, uh, let's blindfold you. I mean, can you pour me a glass of water? You'd realize you, uh, you need the eyes that you have as well in order to simply pour a glass of water. The reality is, is that like a simple action, one that you possibly do in some form every day, is much more complicated than you may have thought about before, than we even think about. It's easy to think that pouring is mostly a hands-on operation and that's not entirely incorrect, is it? Like you do need your hands. They, they play a really important role in pouring a glass of water. So it's not entirely incorrect, uh, or not entirely um, incorrect to say that it's a hands-on operation, but it's not entirely correct either, is it? Like it's easy, easy for us to get too narrowly focused at times. And unfortunately, when it comes to church and how we view and how we do church, it can easily be one of those places, one of those times, one of those areas where we get too narrowly focused. It's easy to get fixated on how everything affects us and, and what, what I think of it, right? Let's just think of some examples for um, how it works often in church world. Like what else did you have to do this morning? Maybe that's why you're watching online. It's because you had something else to do other than gathering uh, at the church or something like that. Um, if you do come to the church building, you know, what parking spot would you have preferred? And would it be available? Um, does the church start time suit your needs or should it be a different time? Do you like the coffee that we have or would you like a different coffee? Or are you not a coffee fan? Do you wish we had more tea options? Is the room a good temperature? I know we've had some heat issues at the church lately. So is it at the temperature that you'd like? Too hot, too cold, just right? Um, is the seating set up how, how you want it? Like, are you, did you get the, a seat that you wanted, a, a spot where it's kind of positioned the way that best suits you and what you want? Um, do you like who you saw when you came to church or do you know the people or not really know them? Were they friendly to you? Um, did you know the songs that we sang? Did you like the songs that we sang? Did you wish there was no songs, more songs? Do you like my outfit today? Yeah, is my preaching funny enough or not funny enough or too funny, too serious, too shallow, too deep, too concerned about myself here rather than maybe you? Outside of Sunday mornings, are, are we connecting with you during the week? Um, are we offering the kind of outreach opportunities as a church that suit your passions, the things that you care about? 
uh, are the life groups that we offer or are going to be offering here very soon, um, ones that fit your schedule and your interests, and uh, are we spending our church money the way that you would spend a live church money? I'm not just, I'm not assigning value or making any judgments on what is right or wrong at this point, okay? All I'm doing is I'm just trying to help us come to a common understanding here. There are plenty of areas where I could have a lot of thoughts and concerns for how things affect me. Things around the idea of church and how they affect me, right? I mean, I just, I just went through that whole long list just to show us that that's, that's definitely a reality. I have a lot of opportunities to be concerned and think about how things affect me. And I know this is true because I'm the pastor. And six years ago, seven years ago, really, I was planning and dreaming and starting this church. And I had a lot of things to think about when starting this church. Like, okay, well, what do I want? What, what do I want to see when it comes to this, right? Everything gets, gets to be whatever I want because I'm the, the, the pastor and the church planner. Uh, not quite, no. Actually, there's been plenty of times in the history of our church where um, I've had to let my personal preferences get overruled. Sometimes we, I remember singing songs that I, I really didn't like, but you know, it wasn't about my personal preference, or we were doing an uh, outreach event that maybe I didn't want to do, or we were doing all kinds of things. Like, it wasn't my personal preferences, because it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's not my church. It, it's whose church? We talked about last week. It's Jesus' church. It's his church. Jesus is going to build his church. And, uh, and that's why the church is sometimes referred to as the body of Christ. I want you to look at this one verse here, and we're going to dig into it a little bit here. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. This is one of those verses where it calls the church the body of Christ. Paul says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Now hold on for a second here. For starters, let's think about this. Carrying the image of deity, like you are the image of Christ, is kind of a big deal, isn't it? Like in those ancient times of when Paul was writing this in AD 55 to the church in Corinth, as you probably know, back in those days especially, kings loved to set up images of themselves all over these great, huge golden or bronze images to show their power and their dominion. And um, they would have, again, whether it's stone or wood or gold or bronze or whatever statues all over the place to remind people who was in charge. I'm in charge. But Jesus didn't opt to do that. Like he didn't, he never even asked for cross pendants that will sometimes wear, you know, to, to, to be made to remind people of him or something like that. He instead created a people, an ecclesia, which is the Greek word, if you remember from last week, for church. He created a people, a church, and said, these folks will carry my image into the world. They're going to show people me. But that's just one part of what makes this single small sentence so profound here in 1 Corinthians 12. Can you imagine seeing Jesus in the flesh during his three years in ministry? And just think about it. Can you imagine you being there when Jesus himself healed somebody, when he performed some sort of miracle? Can you imagine you being in the crowd of 5,000 who got to have a free lunch that one day? Um, can you imagine hearing him, hearing his voice teach uh, as he as he's live on a countryside over there in Israel and all, and he's teaching, and you're thinking, this is unlike anything else I've ever heard. So Jesus was doing this in the flesh from around 30 to 33 AD, right? Like that's the period of his ministry, 30 to 33, when he started doing his ministry, public ministry, until he was crucified. And so the people of that time, at least many of them, had personally seen or at least heard of this Jesus and what he had done during that time. If you were alive during that time, you'd heard of Jesus probably. Huge crowds were gathering, which proves they'd heard of Jesus and this stuff. They witnessed it or they had a friend who witnessed it. So when Paul writes 1 Corinthians and tells the church of Corinth that they are part of the body of Christ, you are the body of Christ and you are members individually of it, it's around 55 AD that he writes that book. So that would be about 22 years later, right? That's how math works, okay? You follow me? Now, you probably have to be about, let's say, five or six. I know for different people here it's different, but you have to be about five or six to easily recall momentous moments, like when you saw Jesus heal somebody, or like when you saw Jesus feed 5,000 people, or things like that, or raise Lazarus from the dead. But that means that anyone 27 or older could have very well been direct eyewitnesses to Jesus and all he did when Paul's writing this. 
And anyone at all could have easily have heard firsthand stories from other people who saw it firsthand of Jesus and all he did. And yet in that crazy context of these people being eyewitnesses to Jesus, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes to the church in Corinth, and, said, and as well as us, by, um, by you know, having it be in Scripture, and says that we are the body of Christ. I want to read it one more time. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. What's cool here also, when you think about it, is that we together are the body of Christ, but that it's clarified that individually we are members of that body. So it's not that you and I lose our individuality in becoming part of the body of Christ. Not, not like you don't matter as far as who you are, all of your unique personality and gifts and all that. Just You're just one of many. You just, you know, you kind of this almost like Buddhist kind of view of just like nirvana. You just kind of, your aura becomes part of a bigger thing that you lose who you are. Um, apparently who we are individually still matters to Jesus. And I think that's awesome. But it's also important that we see that now we are part of the body of Christ. And again, can you imagine what kind of high expectations there would be for the original audience of people who Paul's writing to when he says this, when they hear that we are the body of Christ. Um, not like high expectations like some people have about church where things need to be done my way and be perfect and accommodate my needs and things like that. No, I'm, instead, we're talking about the expectation of some real supernatural power showing up and working in and through that body of Christ, right? You would expect that if you're going to say it's the body of Christ. Well, Christ was doing a lot of supernatural things. So that begs an important question for us today. How on earth are we, as the church, going to fulfill such a huge responsibility and a huge calling of being the body of Christ in the world? I want us to go back a bunch of verses from where we started uh, to get a a bigger picture of things. And I want to read a larger section here of 1 Corinthians 12. So join me in verse 4 as Paul writes, and he says, now there are, and let's find out the answer first here. What is the power? How are we going to go ahead and do this crazy big calling? We're about to find out. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. There we go. For the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit, and there's again that answer for how we're going to do this, the utterance of wisdom. And to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, um, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he will. So he's going to give these things the Spirit is, the Spirit of God. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. 
Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has, that, there's that verse we read earlier, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? The answer is no. He doesn't say it, but it's rhetorical. But, he says, earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And then he goes on into the famous 1 Corinthians 13 chapter on love, because it's love that is the more excellent way of the church operating as the church is meant to operate, especially in all of its diversity that it has. Like, did you notice that element to what all he said there in the 1 Corinthians 12, that passage we just read? That there was a lot of diversity of gifts, a lot of diversity of callings, a lot of diversity of backgrounds, slave or, or free, Greek or Jew. Church is not meant to be an hour and a half where we segregate into gatherings around town with people that are just like us. We already have enough of that. We can live in neighborhoods with people that look like us and are like us. Go to work with people that look like us and are like us. Hang out at events with people that, are, that look like us and are like us and like things we like. And we can worship with people that are like us. But the church is actually meant to be a place where diverse people gather under the unifying power of a Jesus who is for all people, no matter what. But that makes this next part even more difficult and at the same time even more profound. So I know I read a lot of that passage because there was so much good stuff in it and I really wanted to uh, you know, let, us, let us hear it all. But for the rest of our time, and, and as I again I want to dig into something here, I want to have us just focus on one verse in that passage we read to see what Jesus wants to build when he promises to build his church. So uh, y'all ready? Here we go. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 said, we read it already, but I want to just, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So one, to each, meaning if you're a part of, if you've confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've committed to living your life for him, you, each, each, he gives the spirit to each of us. So it's not just some, not the super spiritual, not the people that had it all together. Each of us is given, God gives it. You don't earn it. You don't just kind of like somehow dig it up somewhere. God gives it to you. It's a manifestation of the spirit. So I want us to see that there's that sense of like, this is not just a personality trait. This is not just a, uh, a skill or a talent. This is God saying, I want to give you a bit of my spirit. And then here's the part that I think we can sometimes just kind of like breeze past. And I wanna, instead, I want to focus on it. For the common good. So when you become a part of, through confessing Jesus as your Lord and Savior and following him with your life, when you become a part of the church, you're given a portion, uh, you're given the Holy Spirit, you're given a, a piece of what God wants for you for the common good. So I want to ask this one big question of us today for us to really wrestle with. This is the one thing for today. What if the church's common good were more of a common concern? Today is Super Bowl Sunday. If you're watching this uh, on the day that it's being released and uh, here on Sunday, it's also Super Bowl Sunday. So I want to use that um, that since that's there, as an example for us. There's a difference between a team sport like football versus an individual sport, right? Like the more individual the sport is, we have the Olympics going on right now, lots of individual sports, the more individual the sport is, the more the strengths and the weaknesses are centralized on affecting one person, the person who's the individual. But in a team, the different parts all affect each other. If you don't make the play, who's affected? The whole team. If you didn't practice, who suffers? Not just you, the whole team. If you simply don't show up or you show up drunk, uh, who's going to be hurt? Not just you, the whole team. Using a different metaphor here, just because some of us aren't sports people, and I get that. Um, but I want us to still see why this team and this working together thing matters. It would be like having a fire in your house, but then being like, oh, yeah, but... But it's in our guest room, and we like hardly ever really use that or go in there, so like that's not a big deal, right? Uh, that still matters. If you got a fire in your guest bedroom, it still matters for the rest of the house. That would still be a big concern, right? I get that there are a lot of things that we can be concerned about in this life, but I really want us to see here today how much Jesus is concerned about his church. 
his body, his people. So what if the church's common good were more of a common concern for us? What would that look like practically? Because I don't want to just like theorize. I mean, what does this look like practically? For starters, what priority would there be, would there probably be in gathering together with each other then? Let me ask you, what kind of priority would the, the life and being part of the life of the local church look like if it was a common concern for us, the common good of the church? Uh, when we gathered, who would be responsible for creating a warm and welcoming environment for people? Would it be a few people? Like a handful of people that were designated as our, our hosts, our greeters, our, or would it be we, we were all commonly sharing that? Um, who would see, if the church's common good were more of a common concern, who would see trash on the sidewalk or a dirty coffee mug and do something about it? Um, what would our conversations with each other look like? How would we care for each other? During the week as well, not just on Sunday mornings, because church is way more than just Sunday mornings, but during the week, how would we care for each other? How would we give? Would we honestly feel comfortable saying that what money we have is ours, but that we'll be okay taking advantage of the generosity of others? Or would we contribute? Something at least. Listen, I promise that I don't want this message to be a guilt trip. That's not at all the goal of today and what I think God has for us today from this passage. I instead want it to be an inspiration of what could be. What I see a, a bit of here at Alive, but what, I, what could be and what I think God calls us to constantly put as a vision before us. Of, I want to cast a vision for how our church could operate as a church to give us a sense of, can you just imagine if? Because... Can you imagine if everyone who was a believer in Jesus and was a committed member to a live gave financially? Like, let's just talk about that for one second. Um, can you imagine the new global partners that we would get to invest into? The other countries that we would be knowingly pouring our, um, our resources into to help bring the gospel to? The outreaches that we'd be doing here locally? the ways that we'd be able to bless our city and the, the hurting people in Fredericksburg area even more, the, the staff maybe that we would be able to hire to really grow our ministry even stronger here at Alive, the, um, the expansion of maybe our facilities even, giving us more space to, to have more people gather together. And here's the thing, giving financially is just a very small part of what I'm talking about today. That's not actually the main thing. I, here, can you imagine if everyone who was a believer in Jesus so, therefore, a part of his church took seriously their role as a part of this local church. So can you imagine then if they prioritized coming and participating and being uh, contributing and a, a, a helpful member of when we gather together? Imagine the energy in the room every Sunday if we gathered, if everyone was like, I called this place home, so I'm going to prioritize being here. And I'm gonna pri I know I've got something to give and I want to encourage the people that come and I want to I make, make it better. So we, we really, imagine if we all owned our opportunity to pray for Alive. We all said, you know, this is a church that I'm, I'm committed to and I'm pouring into, so I want to pray for it regularly. Imagine that, what that church would look like. Imagine if we sought to contribute to the needs of each other so that we had a problem with too many people coming to set up the room and the chairs. Um, what if we had too many meals for the meal trains that we were doing for all the different moms that have had new babies or the people that have been sick and in the hospital? Like, again, can you imagine if we had too many life group leaders? We just, we just had so many people who were willing to go ahead and open up their homes on a weekly basis to do that. Can you imagine if we had those kind of problems? If we had so many people who were offering to help that we had too many. Can you imagine if we knew that God had big things for us to pick up, you know, pick up as a church in 2022? Going into our seventh year as a church, God had big things for us to pick up. So can you imagine if we knew, like really knew, that if we're going to pick up some big stuff, that we wouldn't just need strong hands, but strong arms, strong legs, strong feet, strong eyes, that we need the whole body to be strong. What if we saw how it was all connected and decided to contribute what we've been given specifically for the common good? What if we had it as a focus to not just focus on how we could be best served, but what we can do that'll be best for the rest? Like I think we sometimes think that our little bit that we have to offer doesn't make that much of a difference. You know, it's, it's easy in these moments then to lose sight of the big picture and think that we're, it's not that big of a deal, whether I do it or I don't, and we can get disheartened. But that was happening during World War II. 
when Britain was experiencing some of its darkest days of the war and the country was really having a unique struggle. They, they couldn't keep enough men working in the coal mines. Now why? Well, because many of them wanted to give up that dirty, thankless job in the coal mines to go join the military service. They wanted to be fighting on the front lines. Heck, there was a lot more public praise and support for those people fighting on the front lines, and there was so much significance to that kind of work during a war over just mining coal out of a deep hole in the mountain, you know? So, knowing this and being a particularly gifted leader, Winston Churchill set up a gathering to speak to the thousands of coal miners of his country. And at this meeting, he painted a really unexpected picture of a day of victory that he saw for Britain in this war. And as a leader, when we paint pictures, it, it's so important um, and so valuable because it really helps people to see things. As he painted this picture, he talked about the grand parade that would honor the people who fought in the war. First, he said, would come the sailors of the Navy. And then next would be the, the best and brightest of Britain, the pilots of the Royal Air Force marching in. And then after that in the parade, following them would be the soldiers who had fought at Dunkirk on the ground in the trenches, fighting there on the ground and all that kind of stuff. And then he said, last of all, um, would come the coal dust covered men in miners caps. And Churchill said, someone from the crowd might like holler and say, and where were you during the critical days of the struggle? And the voices of 10,000 men would respond, he said. We were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. See, because Churchill knew, and he wanted those thousands of discouraged coal miners to see that the unique role that they played in the big picture was valuable and honestly essential for the big win to happen. If there wasn't coal keeping the, the nation fueled, literally, then they wouldn't be able to win the war. So they had to keep doing and contributing what they're contributing. See, a clear vision of the goal would help them see the importance of their role. And I wonder if we just need God to give us a new, fresh vision for what the church, specifically this one that we call our church home here at Alive, can be. What if Jesus used this year to expand our view of what he could do in and through Alive? Imagine if we long to contribute our part because we knew that no matter what we may, um, maybe immediately saw, that it was making a meaningful difference. That whatever we're contributing to the common good here at Alive is going to matter. That it mattered for the common good and that the common good was more of a common concern that we shared. What if we made an effort this year to simply make Alive the healthiest that it could be? Each of us. Not some of us expecting that our role is to come in and just consume, but that we knew that we're all here as co-laborers to make alive the healthiest that it can be. We do away with all of the insecurity or the self-centeredness that keeps our eyes off of the common good. And instead we say, this year will be our healthiest year yet as a church. And by the grace of God, I'm not just believing for that, but I'm actually I'm working for that too. What if we each were able to say that? I'm working for that. I wanna tell you what, what that looks like, to work for that in a really, really practical way. But that's actually where we're headed next week in our message as we get to part three of the Build Your Church series. So you'll have to wait for that. But this week, let's just have a perspective of, of kind of like Churchill and those coal miners realizing that the common good is what Jesus called us to do and use the manifestations of the Spirit that He's given us for. And every way that we can contribute to that honors the body of Christ that Christ has called us to. So let's do that. Let's honor the sacrifice that Jesus has made to give us this opportunity to be a part of His church and to make a difference in the world by being a part of it.